Toronto, Indiana. No Kawhi Leonard sitting out the second night of a back-to-back. And Kyle Lowry, first game back after missing the last six, paying immediate dividends. Look Toronto at takes it. Look at him, showing his leadership right there, Chris. Victor Oladipo, not his best game. Six for 15 from the field, 16 points, hitting that jumper. Indiana takes the lead with the Boyan bucket. Then Powell said, let's play a little D to get out some easy transition buckets. And then Kyle Lowry has put a little Lowry's on it. Wait, aren't they the ones supposed to have tired legs tonight after the Supposedly. back from last night's game? But now Allegedly. they're sharing, sharing, and they're they letting it rain. News off. Fake news. <laughs> yeah. okay. Toronto 10 for 18 from three-point range in the first half. Second half, there's Siakam running a break. One of eight assists from mm. Kyle Lowry. <laughs> He was hanging from the rim. We <laughs> 12 points, 10 rebounds for Siakam. Lowry, we've seen that so much in his career. Look, he's saying he's grabbing my arm, too, and I'm still hitting the shot. Ooh, is, is that the surge protector? Yes, we're seeing that more often, protecting the rim and then hitting the open jumper. Seven of nine from the floor for Ibaka. 18 points for him. Chris Bucci. Knocking it down. Toronto shot 17 for 33 from three-point range. Their bench scored 52 points. And it's been a couple of years that we've been hearing about the Toronto Raptors bench having this kind of production. Eight different guys scoring double figures. They're now 8-2 and two when Kawhi Leonard sits. And now they're the first team to 30 wins this season in the NBA. That bench, a huge part of it. Well, think about this. They scored 121 points against the number one team in the NBA in opponents' points per game. Mm -hmm. That's pretty darn good when you can do that. Obviously, having eight guys scoring in double figures is part of it. But when you shoot 52 from the floor, 52 from the three-point line, 94 from the free throw line, you're having a good night. Yeah, you're having a good night. Everyone's buying into sharing the basketball. And, and normally, though, Chris, when your superstar goes down, people try to do too much. I just think the way this team, from top to bottom, coach is realizing their roles. So when someone uh, is out the game, someone else steps up. And then you bring back an all-star caliber guy like Kyle Lowry, he just carries his weight. 30 assists. 30 assists tonight. For 30 assists and eight of them from Kyle Lowry. And something we've seen when Kyle has been out it's not necessarily that first unit because Fred Van Fleet's excellent, but with the second unit, they lack that point guard. To have Kyle Lowry step in without Kawhi is a huge luxury. Well, it's a huge luxury to have an all-star caliber player back, but a lot of times when guys come back from injury, they try to do too much. Where, where like tonight, is Kyle took his time. Only 10 shots tonight, only six you know, at halftime. So his first broken play, long rebound. How do you lose a guy like Kyle Lowry off a loose rebound? It's hard to do. He knocks down one of those threes we talked about. Now here in transition, you get a good half-court stop. You're pushing the ball down court. Transition one-on-one -on -one defense. Stop the ball. You don't stop the ball. You get the end one. You go to the free throw line. Knock down your free throw. Now half-court set. This is the patience I'm talking about. Now you direct traffic. Make sure everyone's in their position. You tell the big moves to come set a good screen. You turn the screen slowly. Nice pocket bounce pass so the big fella can catch it and finish the play. That's the leadership. That's the patience of having an all-star type player back like that and not trying to do too much but leading the show. Certainly the Toronto Raptors leading the way in the Eastern Conference. Big weekend for them. Went over the Milwaukee Bucks mm -hmm. and over the Indiana Pacers. Washington OKC in action as well. Russell Westbrook. Ooh, okay. All right. Kind of quiet tonight. That was what? Leather pants? Jacket. Yeah, for him, that's subdued. Quiet, yeah. The game, loud when he hits this three from the pass from Paul George. I like it. But the first quarter, it belonged to one Bradley Beal. Paul George, excellent defender. So is Steven Adams. Doesn't matter. 12 points in the first quarter for Beal. Part of a 16-2 Washington run. You ever think that maybe in Beal's mind, without Wall being there, he's not thinking about, uh, it's maybe John's time to get a shot, so I won't take this shot. He's got more freedom, maybe, mentally. I like it, Coach. Jeremy Grant from the DMV gets three of his 17, the and one, and Otto Porter, welcome back. Coming off the bench for the Wizards, providing a spark. Come on, Otto, they need you, they need you. Paul George. 20 points, four rebounds, five assists. Westbrook, 
A triple-double in the third quarter. Finished with 22, 15, and 13. But the Wizards see them ahead by eight and pushing it. That's Otto Porter again hitting a big shot and Beal stepping back for three more. Well, sometimes you need to go to the bench maybe to wake Otto up a little bit. Uncle, Uncle Jeffy knocks one down, so it's like the freedom to coach's point. Everyone played with snap. Bradley Beal finished with 25, five rebounds, six assists. This is just the Wizards' first road win in their last nine road games. In fact, it's their first win in OKC ever. Ever, ever? One in nine franchise record wow. visiting OKC. This was a, a, a huge win for Washington from the standpoint of when you you think about the season, you go, wow, what a disappointing season Washington's having. When you look in the standings, there are three games out of being in that eighth spot in the playoffs. So big, big win for them. Speaking of those uh, bigs, Jared Allen plays big for the Brooklyn Nets on both ends of the four. And so does Montrez Harrell for the LA Clippers. I think we're, we're seeing this more thing hustle, here, right? More hustle and more hustle. And the hustle from the young fella. If you don't know his name, commit it to memory. John Collins running the floor for the Atlanta Hawks. And that's up next on Game Time. Out of Minnesota, Tom Thibodeau reportedly out as the president and head coach of the Timberwolves. According to the Minneapolis Star Tribune, Ryan Saunders looks like he's in the running to step in as the interim head coach. What do you think of that decision, 3D? I, I like it a lot. Um, obviously, you know, his dad kind of setting the way for him and being around the franchise pretty much his whole life. And I think Coach being young and, and understanding what Cat and Wig and this young team's about, Derrick Rose uh, is having a phenomenal year, comeback year, so to speak. He's been a part of that movement, working out with him on days off. So the question for me, Coach, is what advice can he reach out to someone like yourself to help him with in-game coaching decisions, things of that nature, but being able to relate to the players, knowing the system, I think he's ready for it. First of all, we have to realize that they fired one of the top five coaches, in my opinion, in the NBA. Mm -hmm. Tom Thibodeau is a teacher. Mm -hmm. He's a game coach. He wins basketball games. Uh, so to make that decision, something was going on that we obviously don't know right now. Uh, the relationship with Saunders and the owner is the father connection. Flip Saunders was a very, very loyal person to the owner. Mm -hmm. And the owner, I think, always appreciated it. We'll never forget some of the things that Flip did for him along the way. I know this. Flip made him an awful lot of money mm -hmm. at one point on one major decision that he had to make. And the owner, I don't ever think, is going to forget that. Right. And as a result, he's seen his son pay the dues. He respects what the son has done, respects the son and father, and therefore he's given him a chance. Well, according to the Minneapolis Star Tribune, their source on, uh, their source on Ryan Saunders being who Glenn Taylor wants as the, uh, the head coach long term. So he's hoping that he can earn that spot. But we also have reports uh, from multiple sources that Fred Hoiberg is in consideration for either the GM or the head coaching spot. So we're hearing two names out there. It's interesting because Fred Hoiberg was in Chicago following right. Tom Thibodeau now, could possibly follow him in Minnesota. And they have Scott Layden still, I believe, yeah, Scott still, still, still the there. And, and Scott Layden gets along with everyone. Yes. Remember his pedigree, his background, coming out of that San Antonio program, a lot of people were after Scott Layden. So I think Scott Layden, I hope Scott Layden's given a chance. If they bring Hoiberg in, can Layden and Hoiberg work together, together in the yeah. front office? Yeah. That'd be something to look at. Certainly a situation that is just now developing in Minnesota. But as we see this, you see Tom Thibodeau, like you say, a great coach in the league. Why make this move now at this point in the season? Well, obviously, we don't know exactly what's going on behind closed doors, but to Coach's point earlier, the way our league is going, Cat has a direct line to the ownership. We know Wiggs just signed his new contract. Most of us around the NBA were saying to ourselves, what's taking this team so long to be further along when you look at Denver and other young teams who are winning and playing top-notch basketball? Lately, they're 5-3. and three. They're playing good. Cat's playing out of his mind. Maybe they wanted to pull the trigger now, Coach, to get ready for maybe some more trades possibly before February. Certainly an interesting situation that we will keep you updated on as the night for Griff. Stop me if you've heard this before. Jimmy Butler 
not happy about his situation. Why is this different than any other time we've heard this from Jimmy Butler? Well, if you just suspend the fact that it's Jimmy Butler, you don't think about what's happened to him historically in the past to get to this point. This specific episode is not that unique. This happens often. Mm -hmm. Players will challenge coaches in meetings during film, etc. It just doesn't get out. To me, what's significant about this issue is not that it's Jimmy saying he's uncomfortable with the offense because I would bet Jimmy's had conversations with Brett Brown where he shared these thoughts privately as well. He's probably told Brett when he came over, look, I run hot. This is how I work. I'm really competitive. I'm going to burst out once in a while. Come back at me the same way because I know he wants you to push back just as hard. What's meaningful to me is it got out. And that, to me, is representative of the fact that there's been some discord there already. They've already had issues with the fit of Joel and Ben Simmons a little bit. They've had issues along the way where people aren't necessarily happy with the fit and role. And when you're 25 and 14 and you're playing as well as they're playing, it's unusual to have that level of discontent. I agree with you. I'm a little bit worried that it got out. Um, but we've seen the situation before with Jimmy. Some stuff has got out. My biggest thing that worries me, though, is this is Jimmy's third stop. Normally in baseball, they say three strikes and you're out. And he's had problems, whether it be with young players, coaches, other star players, at every single stop. There was rumors that him and Derrick Rose had a little bit of a riff. Same thing with him and Carl Anthony Towns and Wiggins. Now we see this here uh, with the coaching staff. The, uh, we see the situation with him and Embiid a little bit. Seems like they're going back and forth. I just see a, a lot of smoke. And for somebody that is going to be up for a maximum extension, you would think that Jimmy Butler would be on his best behavior. If I'm some of the other teams in the league and I'm thinking about throwing max dollars at this guy, that has to be a red flag. I have to start to consider maybe this isn't the guy. Maybe I go out to somebody that's less talented but more um, tolerable in my locker room because money just makes you more of what you already are. This guy has been here six weeks, and he's already cutting up, talking about he needs the ball, challenging the coaching staff. What do you do and what do you think is going to happen if you give him $200 million? He might cut a slam full. No, and I, I think that's true. And certainly because it's Jimmy, you do take into account the history. But I do think it's incredibly common for these conversations to take place and for players to be uncomfortable with their role, particularly when the fit of the pieces is as wonky as it is in Philly. Everybody wants things to be a little different. You remember earlier, Joel was not happy that he was playing so far away from the rim. And the reason they were doing that was a la Brooke Lopez, they were trying to open the floor for Ben. So there's already those seeds of discontent. So what Jimmy then ends up doing is he makes the situation seem much worse. But I think there have been several times in the league where you thought it was a brush fire and there wasn't even smoke. And if it wasn't Jimmy Butler, I don't think this is even a story. But because it's Jimmy, that's the story. And to me, the story is it got out and they're unhappy winning this much. I don't know. It's just, it's just, it just doesn't sit right with me because he had the problem with Carl Anthony Towns in Minnesota and who was the guy. And the, now we see the situation here. I can't be used like, whoa, 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 whoa. When you're not the guy, you have to figure out how to play with the guy. It's the same thing that we experienced in Cleveland. Kevin Love was not happy with his role. He didn't challenge uh, Blatt. He didn't challenge T. Lou. He eventually figured out how to play with LeBron James because he was not the best player on that team. I don't know if Jimmy Butler has gotten that memo that Embiid is the best player on that team. But Kevin, and that worries me, once again, if I'm another team or if I'm a, a GM thinking about throwing this guy money. Like, if you're the Lakers and you're going after Jimmy Butler, is he going to get in line with LeBron James dominating the ball out here? Like, these are all the questions that you have to ask yourself when you bring Jimmy Butler in here. He is costing himself money by the day. Yeah, and I don't disagree with the costing himself money thing. If it gets out that Philadelphia does not offer him max, it will be a very bad sign. And other teams around the league will wonder what's wrong. And they will agree, well, this is a problem for Jimmy. But if Philly is going after him full bore and they're offering him max, I think that will be something that teams sort of mitigate. And Kevin Love, you're right. He wasn't initially comfortable with his role, and it took him a long time to find peace with what was being asked of him. He was still voicing it. It's just that he had a different style of doing that. He approached it differently. You have to know that Jimmy's going to be a guy who's going to be all fire and come at you direct all the time. That's who he is. So, again, 
If he had not had the issues he'd had, I don't even care that he's uncomfortable where he's at right now. It's fine. But to your point, because he's done it so many times, he could potentially cost himself money if he doesn't eventually assimilate and be somebody who helps them win basketball games. I just think that one of my favorite boxers is Miguel Cotto. And he had a line when he was talking to another fighter. He said, in every fight I was in, I've always known what side I was, whether I was the A side or the B side. I don't think Jimmy Butler realizes sometimes what side he's on. He's the B-side. He's acting like he's the A-side. You can't come in here talking about, hey, I want to be used this way and I want this, that, and the third. This is Joel Embiid's team. You need to do things in a more diplomatic type of way. You need to talk to Joel. You need to figure out how we're going to play together. But you have to understand, everything runs through the big fella. And I don't think that Jimmy Butler is all the way on board with that. So, Brendan, we fully explored Jimmy Butler's side of this, but you see the Brett Brown quote on the screen. I didn't think it went over the line. If it did, I would have addressed it. He has okay? to say that, though. So for Brett Brown going forward, the rest of the guys on the team, whether it's Joel Embiid or Ben Simmons, the other people he has to deal with, is this something that may hamper his job going forward if Jimmy Butler is able to speak out in this way and there's not repercussions? No question. We don't know if it went over the line or if it didn't. But here, let's just say for Devil's Advocate, it went over the line. He's officially just lost that locker room because he didn't, now no one respects him. If it went over the line and people think it went over the line and then he comes out and covers and says, oh, no, it didn't go over the line. It's OK. And he doesn't check Jimmy. Now people think you're soft. And now what happens, the ripple effect is when Brett Brown wants to yell at Landry Shamit, he's going to be looking up be like, you don't talk to Jimmy like that. Don't, don't come at me all hard don't, with all that fire. And coaches slowly but surely the trust erodes away and people just start looking at you like, yeah, whatever. And that's what happens. And that's part of this as well. Jimmy has to understand when he does this, it's not just about Jimmy. That's part of the problem. I think he's living in a Jimmy world and he's only thinking about Jimmy Butler. He's like the NBA's version of Antonio Brown. <laughs> we, we talked about this when they brought him in. They were absolutely increasing both their ability to be really good out of timeout late and design some things that opponents can't deal with. And they were also really incre increasing their volatility. And Jimmy brings that 100%. There's no question because of how hot he runs. I look at this, though, and I think a team that's this good, they're 25 and 14 overall. They're playing at a very high level in general terms since Jimmy got there. When you come into the season with the expectations they had, and the only thing that's going to spell success for you is making it to a finals or at least an Eastern Conference finals, you're either all the way with me or you're all the way against me. So where this becomes interesting is come trade deadline, if they've got people in that room that are against them, they need to act on it because that's the one thing that unequivocally derails the season. This kind of thing is adversity, which is opportunity. You galvanize from this or you get radically worse, but at least it reveals something to you. Where this becomes actually meaningful and I liked his quote saying what he said, but what be when this becomes actually meaningful is, A, if you're right about losing the locker room, which certainly I don't think you can say he's done to this point, but if they're not all the way on board with what's being asked of them as a team, then Elton Brand's going to have to start to jettison some of those pieces who aren't. And that's when this becomes intriguing to me. Well, that's the problem. I think the piece that you're talking about is Jimmy Butler. <laughs> Wow, and they just acquired him, what, 21 games ago? It was all good just a week ago. Mavericks, ago. one of those games, uh, one of eight games tonight. Also, the Raptors, Bucks, this game we're waiting for 8.30 right here on NBA TV. That guy, Nikola Jokic, had himself a game. Highlights coming your way.